University of New York. And this was a very <coughs> ambitious title that I picked before I got my data back. So today I'm going to be showing you some preliminary data um, where I'm examining uh, genome-wide SNPs in a group of North Atlantic sea stars. So broadly, I'm interested in how species respond to environmental change. Uh, this is a fundamental question in population biology. And specifically, I'm interested in understanding how the spatial distribution of genomic variation will be affected by imminent climate change. So one really useful way of studying species responses to environmental change is by focusing on hybrid zones, which are areas where closely related species can interbreed, um, and they can be particularly informative about range shift type dynamics. So um, evidence is growing that climate change is increasing rates of hybridization, um, as species that were previously ge geographically isolated are now coming into contact with each other. Um, and Atlantic marine species um, have shown northward shifts, um, but corresponding shifts of their associated hybrid zones are not as well documented. So these hybrid zone dynamics will give us the opportunity to predict patterns of distributional change, interspecific interactions, and gene flow, and even potentially genomic adaptations associated with climate change. Um, so one of the main reasons I'm interested in this question um, is um, to inform conservation in the face of climate change. So I chose sea stars as my study group because they've been shown to be a keystone species, which means they have a disproportionately large effect on the rest of their communities. So all the way on the right, in these Im images from Tatoosh Island in Washington, you can see changes in the relative abundance of Pisaster acracia, or the ochre sea star. So in panel A, we can see that, um, uh, sorry, we can see numerous Pisaster. Um, one of them is indicated with the white arrow. Um, and um, in the second photo, uh, sorry, the first photo was taken in 1986, below the photo that was taken of the same rock in 2015, um, where we see no pisaster, but lots and lots of mussels. So sea stars are able to maintain stable populations and have community diversity in their systems by preferentially consuming the dominant predators, which are dominant uh, competitors, which are mussels usually. Um, but sea stars, though important, are also under threat. So. They're under threat from habitat degradation, global climate change, and also sea star wasting disease, um, which is a lethal disease that's been affecting sea stars on the West Coast for decades. Um, but up until a couple of years ago, this was exclusively a West Coast problem, um, and now it's finally made its way over to the East Coast um, as of two years ago. So they actually affect the genus that I study, which is the genus Asterius. Um, there are three members of this genus, um, the Northern Pacific sea stars, which are found only in the Pacific, um, and then the two on the right, Asterius rubens and Asterius forbsi, um, they are the North Atlantic sea stars in this genus. Um, so they're a sister, sister species pair of sea stars, um, and they have an interesting punitive demographic history. So it was described in 2001 by John Wares, based only on a couple fragments of mitochondrial data, CO1, and an internal transcribed spacer. So um, that punitive demographic history begins with an ancestral Asterius um, that was exclusively Pacific, but about three and a half million years ago in the early Pliocene, the Bering Strait opened between Alaska and Siberia um, in a well-studied event known as the Transarctic Interchange, when cold temperate and polar marine species were able to move between the North Pacific and the Arctic Atlantic basins. So using that mitochondrial data, Wares also showed that sh shortly after arriving in the Atlantic, these species split into an exclusively North American species known as Asterius forbsi and a distinctly European species known as Asterius rubens. Um, so this mitochondrial data also told him that um, these two species were isolated from each other for a long time until um, Asterius rubens, the European species, colonized North America. And the age of this invasion is largely unknown, um, but Ware's analysis of these genealogical patterns suggested that it was most likely a recent colonization probably followed by the most recent glacial maximum at about 20,000 years ago. So Asterius rubens is still the exclusively European species, but the two species now co-occur on a small portion of the east coast of North America. This is a tree that we produced just based on those mitochondrial fragments, and you can see from this tree that Asterius rubens and Asterius forbsi form distinct groups. But in this paper, we're speculated that there may be a small hybrid zone that was centered around Cape Cod, given the species boundaries boundary that he found in his genetic data. So this understudied group seemed like a great system for me to address the questions I have about environmental change by looking closely at this putative hybrid zone, zone and how it may be changing. But this paper came out almost 20 years ago, so I wanted to see if there actually is evidence of a hybrid zone today, and if so, where that might be. So the first question I asked in this system is, where are these species most likely to co-occur? 
So to answer this, I built species distribution models for each of these species. Um, using, um, I used uh, Wallace to build these uh, species distribution models, which implements MaxSense, uh, a machine learning algorithm that expresses a probability distribution where each grid cell has a predicted suitability of conditions and can be interpreted as predicted probability of presence at each cell. For my occurrence data, I used filtered GBIF data, and for my uh, climate layers, I used all of the MARS spec marine environmental variables. So here's my model for Asteria sporbsi. Um, this suitability is on a color scale that, that shows high environmental suitability in red and low environmental suitability in blue, and this scale will be constant for the next few slides. So one thing to note here, it seems that's interesting, is that there is a preference for deeper water um, in this species, at least south of Cape Cod. And also note that this model shows suitable habitat further north in Cape Cod, even though we know the species is not usually found there. This is because the model uses environmental data to find areas um, um, even outside the known species range where the species could potentially live based on similar, similar abiotic variables. It does not take into account species interactions, so it's possible that the northern species is actually outcompeting the southern species at that, in those areas. So on that note, let's take a look at the SDM for Asterius rubens. This is the European side of the model. Um, the scale for this is the same. And as you can tell from the image, this species is different as it tends to stick much closer to the shoreline, so it's most likely a truly intertidal species. And here's the North American side of that model. So again, remember, this is the historically European species. Um, it's typical to see, but there's actually lots of small pockets of very high suitability in Nova Scotia and down the coast, peaking at Cape Cod, uh, Massachusetts, and Maine. So uh, again, in North America, they seem to be sticking pretty close to shore. And we've seen <coughs> that maybe the southern species also prefer the, prefers those colder waters that are somewhat outcompeted in the north, um, where these, and so they, and they end up in the deeper waters in the southeast instead. So now that I have some idea of where these species are separately, I wanted to know where they are likely found together. Um, and since the SDM can be interpreted as a probability of occurrence, I decided to multiply the two separate probability rasters together to find the probability of co-occurrence, which I'm calling the joint probability of occurrence. So here's the raster showing the joint prob probability of occurrence. Note that this scale is actually from 0 to 0.8 because there were no areas in which both species had a maximum suitability score. So what we're seeing, um, is that the area for the highest probability of co-occurrence doesn't seem to be centered around Cape Cod, but is actually now north of Cape Cod with um, some pockets of high joint suitability in eastern Maine. So it seems that it, there's potential that this hybrid zone could have already moved northward given uh, where study um, in 2001. So my next question was, is there genomic evidence of hybridization? And so to answer this question, um, I collected samples from um, both species ranges, extracted DNA, and sent them out for RADSeq. Um, and the map here is showing both species distributions um, as well as a putative hybrid zone in yellow, um, and as well as, our, as well as our sample localities and their corresponding number of samples. So we sent out a full plate of 95 samples, eight of which were the outgroup, um, and the rest were evenly split between Asterius rubens and Asterius sporbsi, which had been previously identified with mitochondrial data. And the sampling sizes here are actually those from each sampling locality that made it through data filtering. So these are actually ones with high enough coverage um, for population level analyses. So I analyzed this RAD seq data with IPIRAD um, and ended up with about 113,000 SNPs on 24,000 loci. So here's the PCA of these SNPs. Um, we have the outgroup in orange, uh, the uh, Sirius rubens, the European species in green, the Sirius sporbsi in yellow, and then I highlighted the individuals from the hybrid zone in red. Um, so as you can see, Asterius rubens and Asterius amarensis seem to be forming distinct clusters, but Asterius sporbsi, as well as the individuals in the hybrid zone, are so showing much more variation and overlap and are showing a kind of uh, variable climb. Um, I also ran this in structure, um, and using the Ivana method, I determined that my most likely K was three. Um, so structure implements a model-based method to assign each individual to an assumed population in each iteration. And in this bar chart, each, in, each vertical line is an individual, and each color is representative of an assignment to one of three populations. Um, so these samples are arranged with the outgroup all the way to the left, from, and then southernmost to northernmost US samples, followed by Newfoundland, Iceland, Edinburgh, uh, Netherlands, and France. So since the outgroup out is clearly clustering together, I also ran this without the outgroup, and once the outgroup is removed, my most likely k equals two, which makes sense. 
um, and they're also arranged by the same geography. So I just want to point you to a couple of interesting things. First, uh, the Newfoundland samples seem to be clustering very clearly with the European samples, so their neighbors across the ocean. Um, and we can also see here that there are a few individuals that are potential F1s, uh, as they're clustering with each of the two populations almost exactly half the time. These two individuals were found in Massachusetts, and if I overlay this on the map, it's a little bit easier to see where this hybrid zone may be. Um, so we can see that the potentially admixed individuals begin to show up in Massachusetts, but become more common in Maine. And there are even varying levels of admixture in Maine, um, which could suggest that there may be a stable hybrid zone with F1s that might be able to reproduce. But of course, this needs to be tested further with some demographic modeling, but it's still exciting to see. Um, and we can also see that the area of co-occurrence that I identified with my distribu distribution models correlate pretty well with this genomic data. <coughs> so to answer this second question, yes, um, there is some genomic evidence of hybridization, but it needs to be tested further. So um, some next steps um, will include more field work. Um, this summer I'm going to be intensively sampling the hybrid zone from Mass uh, Massachusetts to Maine. I'm going to be filling sampling gaps, um, so Nova Scotia, North Carolina, and Florida. Um, and then I'll be also prepping more samples for uh, RADseq and whole genome sequencing. So you answer some further questions that I have, like what was the timing of this North American colonization and how long have these populations been admixed? <coughs> so the whole genome sequencing will come in handy for this because it provides a different level of resolution um, and allows us to look at recombination while also complementing the analysis I'm currently doing to confirm the demographic history of these species. Another question that I have is how common is hybridization and what is the shape of the hybrid decline? Um, the frequencies of the various genotypes found in the hybrid zone can tell us things about the strength of selection, dispersal, and gene flow. I'm also interested in looking for signatures of selection, um, especially for gamete recognition loci. Um, so one of the things that will make this much easier is the upcoming publish, uh, the upcoming annotated genome of Asterius rubens. Um, so the Wellcome Sanger Institute in the UK is going to be providing uh, reference genomes for 25 previously unsequenced UK species. And the institute actually chose 20 of the 25 and let the public choose the last five. And they chose Asterius Rubens, which makes me feel very special. <laughs> um, and so uh, that will make my work easier because C-star reference genomes are very few and far between. Um, and also, finally, what are the conservation implications of these shifts in genomic variation? So as I discussed before, this, un this group is undergoing an outbreak of sea star wasting disease, um, which we know very little about. So the reason why I put up this really gross slide um, is if you happen to be stomping around in the tide pools of uh, North, uh, North America um, and you see a sad looking sea star with lesions and limb curling, please call me because <laughs> these sea stars die within a week of showing any symptoms, so they're really hard to find samples with this wasting disease. Um, so with that, um, I want to thank a lot of people. Um, and I will take any questions. so fast that um, if you find them in the field, they're usually healthy. Okay.